Just like to welcome you today, I'm um, Don Cole, the producer of Well Productions, and I'm here today with retired Gunnery Sergeant Williams, uh, the United States Marine Corps Historical Company. Uh, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, no problem. And uh, really just start out maybe by telling us a little bit about uh, yourself and the historical company. Well, actually, I spent over 20 years with the United States Marine Corps, and uh, even during that time, I was an avid historian and uh, a historical researcher. Um, as we, as I will reach retirement, and as we started to look at the development of the National Museum of the Marine Corps in Quantico in the early 1990s, we looked at the concept of in the development of a museum. In reality, is we wanted to get with the Marine Corps Museum away from the concept that it's about artifacts. History is about people. I like that, especially for Marines. I like that it's our ethos, our culture per se. I like that we really want to get the story across. And we weren't going to wait and for it to be dependent on people to come to the Museum of Quantico. So we looked at the idea of developing outreach educational program in many different venues. And oftentimes to humanize that history, one of the best ways is to try to make a direct connection is to take Marines and put them in historic uniforms of various eras to help represent and tell the story of the Marine Corps of that particular era at historic sites where the Marine Corps had a presence throughout the country. Over the years, that became extremely effective, and now has evolved into all forms of outreach programming, whether we are using an exhibit and those uniforms and the material history is on mannequins, um, whether it is actually putting Marines in the historic uniforms to help tell a story, or in the film industry and like that, is uh, supporting and consulting uh, with the material history and tactical doctrine of each period. Uh, we also use this as a very strong internal training device is showing modern relevance. And again, that's always important, both on the civilian economy when we're uh, teaching the American public about Marine Corps history, but it's also very important within our own Marine Corps for us to understand who we are, but more importantly, where we came from. And I like that, and this is what we try to get across with the programming development we started in 1990 with the historical company is history is people. And we as Marines have a very unique culture, a culture that didn't happen overnight. It took over 230 some years for that culture to evolve what it is, what makes us a unique, even among American might, fighting forces and such. It's not about the technology we have. It's not about the ura factor that everybody right. likes to associate with the Marine Corps, but it's that culture, that esprit de corps, that spirit uh, that the Marines are dedicated to each other and to meeting the mission and like that. And this is what we eventually evolved into with the historical company, was taking that story out to the public, enticing them to want to learn more about the Marine Corps and bringing it, uh, coming to the National Museum and want to understand more of who we are as a culture. Now, um, the reason I asked Gunny uh, along with us today is um, you also have some extensive knowledge with uh, uh, being on film sets and, and different types of films. And uh, he has a lot of experience in, um, in not only the consulting phase, but also uh, in the action of it and also doing some documentaries yourself. And what I wanted to talk to you with about today is um, just a little bit of the experience that you have with, uh, with consulting on films and, and um, some of the films that you had been on and maybe some of the things that you encountered while you're there. Um, tell me a little bit about how you got into that and, and some of the things that you've done. Good to go. Like I say, again, we got started with the film industry, kind of backdoor uh, early on and such, because we were specialists in material history and tactical doctrine of the various eras. Something that the film industry started, I didn't start it like that, but it's been proving a very effective idea. And something that the film industry has been doing in part or in whole for many, many generations is if they're doing a purely piece, especially about the military, they optimally look at actual military technical advisors to help their actors um, become more believable in their roles. As progression, especially within the last three or four decades, that has become very paramount uh, within the filmmaking industry. You know, like that, such gentlemen as uh, retired Marine Captain Dale Dye, uh, Sergeant Major uh, Jim Deaver, and others uh, like that that make their living now in that industry, and like that have helped bring realism to the theatrical film industry, and you know, like that in having actors not just play the role. But the American society, especially today, is far more educated than even the film industry gives them credit for. Sure. And to establish credibility, even if you're telling a piece that is completely fictional, if it's based on a historical incident or historical fact, is for the audience to get the optimum amount of it. A classic example is the film Master and Commander was just done. They went to extreme lengths to make sure the technical accuracy, even the actions of the individuals, the extras, and I like that, were very believable and accurate to the period. This set the theme, so the story that this direct, uh, director was trying to tell, and I like that, is made much more believable, and the audience would buy into it much more. 
um, and like that. And we found, like say, over the years, because of my background in uh, military tactical doctrine and as a materiel specialist and like that, I have been brought on several films, so starting all the way back with the film Gettysburg, uh, with Gore Vidal's Lincoln and stuff, dealing with the American Civil War uh, uh, area and like that, all the way up into as a senior advisor and a trainer and historian and like that on such films as Wind Talkers, uh, Clint Eastwood's Flags of Our Fathers, Letters from Iwo Jima and such. And over the years, it's been a learning experience for me to understand and get a much better grasp both in theatrical entertainment films and also in the production of documentaries because we've actually worked on both sides of it. And like that. So I've gained a lot of experience in it and a lot of insight um, over the years and it's also helped me quite a bit in the development of our live programs and educational programs we do for the Marine Corps. And also, if uh, anyone out there checks out the trailer to Super 8, if I'm not mistaken, you're Yeah, like I said, that well, was one right? of the little sidelines I like that because of the technical apparatus that we have. Uh, some of the assets that we maintain to help tell the Marine Corps story is all variations of uh, historical firearms, including such things as Mark II flamethrowers that, uh, other than the hands of a few civilian collectors, just don't exist. And we found as early as the film uh, Wind Talkers that Hollywood, despite its phenomenal capabilities in uh, special effects, uh, for live action type films, they were unable, the special effects teams were unable to make a believable flamethrower. Because oftentimes in Hollywood, when they show flamethrowers, they try to use a uh, propane or a lighter than air gas. Well, real military flamethrowers of the era used gasoline, gelled gasoline, heavier than air like that. Right. And it has a whole different dynamics and consistency in the physics of how it shoots forward. Ultimately, when we were doing um, uh, wind talkers, uh, the director, John Woo, wanted to see realism, and he was a very big fan of using fire in his films anyway. That uh, the effects of, uh, special effects of, uh, coordinator and I got together, they found that they couldn't really get a flamethrower to work where it is, so we brought a real flamethrower in. And that kind of started it like that. We uh, kind of built up a little sideline reputation right. that virtually every film now that wants to include a military flamethrower in it, including the, some of the most recent sci-fi films like Super 8, will come to us to use a real flamethrower versus trying to uh, put an effects flamethrower in place. And uh, I've had the fortune uh, with working with you before when you were using that thing. That guy's hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it is. Like some 3,000 degrees coming out of the right. nozzle. And the only thing protecting the operator is his skill. So Now, um, as, uh, and having your experience with film, you also uh, do some documentaries with the historical company yourself. Yes, we do. We've learned over the years that, like that again, with the growing population and with the technology savvy, American society and world society and such, that to get the optimum bang for our buck uh, per se is to look at the concepts of live programming is only as good as the people that are there in front of you. And oftentimes, the message you're trying to get across is overshadowed by the entertainment factor and oftentimes is forgotten within a few weeks after seeing the live program. We started to realize that for longevity, and to establish a legacy, and so we're not, every generation of Marine and Marine historians not having to reinvent the wheel, is with modern technology now, and with the ease, relatively speaking, of the technology, is to start putting documentaries on film, and like that, and also for the first time from a unique perspective. Massive amount of the documentarians that are out there trying to tell various aspects of world history aren't necessarily part of the history they're telling. One of the approaches we're taking like that as Marines, and the vast majority of my staff and volunteers, and myself included, are real Marines. They're also uh, dedicated historians uh, and researchers. I like that. What we're trying to do is telling the history of the Marine Corps from a unique perspective, that of the Marines, through the eyes of Marines, to try to get the American populace not to understand what they see in a theatrical film, okay, Marines, who rob, go blow, blow up the world and such and like that, but who are these people? Why do we... How do we fit into American society? We are part of American society. We came from it, but the Marine Corps has developed its own unique ethos and culture as it evolved over the years. So one of the things we're trying to do with our documentaries now is develop documentaries to help the American public, as well as our own Marines, understand where we came from through our own eyes and, like that, and tell a story from a unique perspective. Because one of the things uh, we've talked about even with our live programs is that history uh, is not black and white. And you've seen this in whether it's entertainment, theatrical films, or whether you see it in like that documentaries. It's oftentimes uh, like that, do even documentaries being made from a specific point of view. I uh, like that is, we talked about like one project you've uh, worked with me on, I uh, like that, is dealing with the documentary we're working on now, dealing with John Brown and the John Brown raid at Harpers Ferry in 1859. 
most people, okay, John Brown, he was an abolitionist, he's trying to you know, free the slaves and such like that. But as you've seen, as we progressed, that's a much more in-depth and detailed story. And it's not necessarily the story that has been Reader's Digest version put out to more of the American public. There was so much more that's complicated in it. And you really can't say from any point of view whether John Brown was a hero, whether he was a terrorist, or he was a, mayor, a murderer, or whether he was a savior. And I like that. We have to look at history, and that's a classy example, from many different points of view. And I like you to really objectively understand and make up our own minds what history is. Right. So what we're trying to do with the Marine Corps documentaries and all the, what I have learned from many years of experience in various points from the film industry is how to basically take and get away from you, using just the material history, but using that as a reinforcement. But talk about the people, talk about the points of view. And like I say, not make anybody villainized, not make anybody a hero. But for we as a society, we are who we are and where we are because both points of view. I like that. One side may not have gained what they uh, wanted. The other side may have. I like that. But it took all points of view to get us where we are today. And understanding those points of view is the only way we can understand history. We kind of, uh, you talked a little bit about the live part and the, and the documented mm -hmm. part. And, that, and from a production company point of view, I, I wanted to talk to you about the documented part that you do. Um, where do you start with the creative process? Where do you start where it says, you say, okay, I want to make a documentary about this. Like, what are your approaches to that? How do you decide what you want to do, how you want to do it? Um, what are, what's your creative process when you start that? Well, what's interesting like that is oftentimes for a live program or a documentary that's going to be put on film follows oftentimes parallel the same ideas. Like in a theatrical film, oftentimes, if somebody comes up with a concept idea, and like say the Marine Corps may come with us and say, we want a program, or a National Park Service site says, we want a program about the Marines, say, for example, Harpers Ferry, that was there. That becomes the foundation. Then it's our responsibility, just like a uh, um, in pre-production for a film, and like that, we need to start planning, is what's going to be the screenplay? What's going to be the story? What is the story we're trying to tell? And like that, so we need to come up with base concepts, then we'll build in details from there. And like I said, the other thing we have to look at is as we write this story, as any good screenwriter for a film has to do, whether it's a live program or if it's going to go on film, and like that, what is the story you're telling and from whose point of view have your brilliant like that? Because oftentimes in a theatrical film, you usually pick a character and look at his perspective in telling the story to get the point uh, and the art uh, and concept across that the director wants to do. We have to do the same thing with a live program. The biggest thing is on a live program is we, unlike the film industry, we got one shot. Right. So we have to get it right and make sure the all the elements of believability, of credibility, are there as soon as we walk in front of the audience. Whereas a film, we can correct it if we basically screw something up and like that and go back. But in the development from that point, you know, like I said, we write scripts, write a screenplay, and storyboard it just like we would if we were going to put it on film. And like that, then we turn around and we have to look at all the mundane things that people never think about either when making a film or for live program. For us, for live programs, it doesn't matter if we're you know, presenting a rock concert or whether we're presenting a, a, a historical uh, uh, program, either in exhibit form, living history, in whatever form like that. We still have to, okay, we've got a live audience coming to see it. We have to first figure out how we're going to take care of the audience, seating, their comfort levels and such, because if we basically have an audience coming out in the middle of July and we're going to make them stand up in the sun for two hours for a program, we're not going to get much out of it. So we have to be very cognizant of what it takes to make the program we're going to do happen. happen. Exact same thing happens in the film industry, whether it's a documentary or a theatrical release uh, like that is, okay, what are your locations? What do you have to do to keep your crew where you need to be, and like that, and all the beans and bullets that go behind the scenes to make what goes on film happen. From taking care of from craft services, taking care of the actors and taking care of the crew, uh, to feeding everybody and like that in remote locations and such, we have to do the same thing with live programming like that. Is how do I take care of the people that are doing the program to get the optimum presentation to the public we're trying to represent? So it starts very similar, whether we're going from a live program or we're looking at building a documentary, from the creative process of, okay, what story would it, would, do we need to show? From what perspective is that story going to be told? What details do we want to bring forth in that story? How much time do we have allotted to tell that story? Which oftentimes, that's very uh, specific when you're dealing with, uh, with a film, for example, and even in a live program. Because how often, if you have a live audience, 
how long can you retain that audience's attention if you have a structured program? So we have, you know, time constraints are a big issue. And then taking what are the key elements, the key message that we want the audience, be it a theatrical audience or a live audience, to walk away with. I like that. And knowing full well that from teaching classes, even to Marines, they'll retain about 2% of what you actually say to them. But if you can motivate them, if you can excite them, and like that, and get something on that emotional level, they can walk away with that. That'll entice them to remember more of what they saw, and more importantly, is entice them to want to learn more. And like that, emotion like that, and film producers have known this for years. The drama, the conflict, and the action like that oftentimes will be a bigger impact on the audience than any dialogue that's ever said. And like that, so getting that concept of emotion and feeling and for us, most importantly, that when you see that hard charger, whether it's in a futuristic set of body armor or in a continental uh, uniform carrying a flintlock rifle, that was a human being, a human being exactly like those audience that are watching them. And what made that human being, that person, different or excelled them to do the feats and accomplish what they did in each era of history and how it has impacted the audience that's watching it. And like I say, so we have to go through that entire creative process, just like any filmmaker does, in developing programs. So basically every hour that we send in front of the public for a live program, we'll spend months of research, development, and preparation. For the documentative part, um, specifically, when would you feel it's important to bring a production company in? I mean, are, you, are your thoughts usually along the lines of, we're going to develop the whole thing, and then just bring somebody in to shoot it? Or is it more of a relationship and a partnership where you're going to collaborate with them and, and work with them? Like, what's your approach when you usually do something like that? Well, like I say, if we're going to be doing a documentary film, just like we've worked with you and such like that, the Marine Corps has been based through its entirety and like that. It's a team effort. It's never about an individual. None of us can do anything in the, on the scope we're doing by ourselves. In developing a documentary film, like say, working with a production company like that, they need to be in literally on the ground floor because the creative uh, concepts that they bring to the table. I, as a historical analyst, can say, okay, this is the story I want to tell specifically about the Marine Corps. I like that. I have ideas of what I would like to see on film, but a person like yourself, like that, as a producer and a director that have experience on how that translates into film, is going to bring their own creative process to the table like that, where we can sit down collaboratively and look at what it takes and like that. It says, okay, you, get, you grasp from the beginning the story I want to tell, but you have the knowledge of how using the camera as an ultimate tool can basically get the optimum projection of that concept and idea to an audience. And like that. So the idea of doing a documentary to do it well can't be just, okay, I'm going to write this whole story, um, you're just a cameraman, and like that, go shoot it. And like that, it has to be a very, very synergistic relationship from the, uh, both sides of the camera are all sides and like that, not only in front and behind the camera, but the writers, the developers, the historians, everything that are involved, from the ground out, it has to be a collaborative process to really get the most effective bang for the buck. Because if the production crew is not brought in on the concepts and ideas, they're going to shoot what they're told to shoot. And oftentimes, what is put on camera oftentimes is not nearly as effective as what it could be if we uh, had the input of the people that are used to filming such things. And then I think um, as a production company, it's one of the things we always focus on is the relationship and collaboration. Uh, like you said, we have worked several times before, so mm -hmm. you know how we work. Um, but what about like some of the keys that, that you look for? Um, you're going to make this documentary. I want to bring somebody in on the ground floor, mm -hmm. and, and we have this concept and this idea. What would be some of the keys that you would look for um, in people that you want to work with and also... Um, um, how you would find out about what they're doing. Well, one of the things I say, this could be really simplified, and I like that, team players. And I like that because I have worked from the major film industry, like that with some very well-known directors such as Clint Eastwood and John Woo, all the way down to small local documentaries and such, is it has to be a collaborative effort and everybody has to be a team player. I have worked with directors even on documentaries that despite, okay, here's the story we need to tell, they want to, are too overbearing in their uh, creativity. Oh, well, we're going to shoot it this way. I don't care what you want. This is the way I want to shoot it as a director. In doing a documentary especially, that cannot be the case. Is the directors and producers on the production team side of the house 
have to grasp and understand that the ultimate goal and mission of what the documentary developers uh, like that want to be. And on the other hand, is we, as the people wanting the documentary done, as the technical advisors, as the historians and such, that wrote the initial story, have to understand where you guys are coming from and like that and be willing to be flexible, says, okay, this is what I want to show in camera, but you as a producer and your directors and such can turn around and say, well, if we shoot it from this angle and like that, we'll get a much better impact of what you want to say. So that teamwork, basically all of us being team players and all of us going to the same goal is paramount when I'm looking at, you know, if I'm going to hire a production team to work with and such, that has to be paramount in how the, uh, the documentary is going to turn out. Because if that synergistic team player uh, mentality is not there on both sides, and like that, ultimately you'll never get the quality product that you want. And that's um, really in any project that, that you do, if you don't come with that attitude of that collaborative effort and to work together, it's, it's not going to be a, a yeah, absolutely, quality production. Absolutely. We as Marines, we can't learn to be team players with each other. We'd never get done what we normally do. So, and and speaking of that, also you take a very unique approach in in your documentaries and your live action um, uh, productions that you do. And uh, the majority, if not all, of the people that are involved with you are former Marines. For, exactly. Uh, how how do you go about that process? And 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 I, that has to be a little bit of a more difficult task than just picking up people that would you know, normally be like uh, some, some extras or things like that. I mean, you use uh, former Marines or current Marines to, in all your Absolutely. productions. Well, actually, there's a couple of reasons for that. And again, as I said, history is not black and white. It's basically made up from individual and collective points of view. And like that, for us to be able to tell us, so we can't tell, for example, telling the story of John Brown, and like that, we try in our live programs to bring assets in to be able to show other points of view, to make the viewing audience think about what's actually being done here. But the main focus for we as Marines is to tell history them from our point of view, from the average grunt, not from the generals, but the average, the grunt, that's following out the orders of those generals, that completing the tasks that make those generals great, what did it take for them and what was going through their minds as best as we can interpret and like that to make it happen? Who best to tell that story who understand even today that culture and ethos that has been breeded into us as Marines than Marines? And like that is our basis for storytelling, be it live or even in documentaries, is through the eyes of Marines. We are out to tell our own story, good and bad, and like that. We understand from the grounds up the ethos, the culture that has been bred into us, what sets us apart, and why we've been able to accomplish, regardless of the technology or era we're, uh, we're presenting, how did we succeed where others failed? And like that, and what mistakes have we made getting there? And like that, in doing that, the downside is taking a 21st century Marine and getting him proficient in the technology of, say, the mid 19th century or the early uh, 19th century, and like that, that poses the challenge. The advantage we've got of using actual Marines is they don't have preconceived notions. You know, we've worked with, and I know the film industry quite a bit, like say, have used reenactors. Um, they're, they're a great group of guys, but oftentimes reenactors and reenacting is a hobby. It's about the uh, desires of the individuals. And oftentimes many reenactors are civilians. And that's not a detriment until there's the fact that when you're trying to present an, all, an image, a culture, and an ethos, as I tell my Marines, we're doing a live program. You better be able to walk out in front of that audience naked and say, yeah, that's a Marine, before you ever open your mouth. It's body language, character, body composition and such. If we look at wars, and like I say, in the film industry has, I won't call it a mistake, but has fallen into the shortfall by using hobbyists as a short uh, means to provide massive scenes. Well, oftentimes, many of the hobbyists uh, that get involved and like that are great guys, are extremely knowledgeable, but they're able to afford what they do because they're now older. And like that, they may not be in the physical condition. And the reality of it is, especially if you're doing a documentary film, is not only showing the accuracy of the material history, the weapons, the equipment, the uniform, but the tactical doctrine, and more importantly, who were the individuals wearing those uniforms. That's what made it work. The average soldier or Marine throughout our history over the last 230 years, if you do a cross-section demographic, uh, like that has been on the average from the American Revolution right up through our current war in Afghanistan, and like that is averaged in their mid 20s, and like that not in their late 30s, early 40s, 50s, and 60s, and like that. So using active duty Marines is basically having a twofold purpose. One, we're showing the demographics of the actual age groups 
that fought these wars and actually accomplished what they did. Not saying there weren't younger and older uh, people in there, but the prime core was this uh, younger uh, uh, mid-20s uh, age group. And more importantly, is that built-in muscle memory, you know, like that, that esprit de corps, that professionalism and stuff, regardless if they have muscle memory of using an M16, it's very easy to take a Marine that does not going out with any preconceived notion, but has that understanding of discipline, immediate abeyance to orders, and all the intangibles that we use to train Marines today. In a half hour, I've been able, and you have seen it happen at live programs, I can take a platoon of active duty Marines and have them become every bit as proficient with that flintlock or that percussion lock musket of the mid-19th century as what they are with the modern M16. Now, teaching the little nuances takes a little bit longer, but that core element, using that to our advantage, not only can we say we're doing a documentary, these are Marines portraying Marines, which has those speaks volumes in itself, and like that, but it's much easier than taking stock civilian extras and, like, and try to train them first to be military and have a military bearing and then train them in the specific skills and like that. So using Marines has many, many very positive advantages. It's also for us as an ethos and like that, we want to be able, we can tell our own story. We don't need somebody that hasn't been one of us to tell our story. And that may sound arrogant, but you know, it's to, uh, to me as a historical analyst and such and like that, who better to tell who and what we are than somebody that's been there, regardless of the era they've actually lived in. And um, to everybody out there that goes and sees one of your live presentations, uh, they can know that everybody that's involved is of that class, right? We try to uh, do that too. Like now, again, you know, our live programs, we do have civilian volunteers that have come in uh, with the program and such, but virtually all of those that have uh, volunteered to come in, again, we have an extreme standards like that. They have to spend the first year, we won't even let them think about doing a living history role or putting on a period uniform. For at least the first year, they're with us. And like that, they had to demonstrate their ability to deal with people, their understanding of the ethos and culture of the Marine Corps, and willing to basically present themselves and being able to tell that story to uh, the American public. And they're b building up their knowledge base. Then, if they meet character profiles, and again, for each of the eras, you know, for our live programming, to help train our active duty Marines and uh, civilian volunteers, we have instructor's guides for finite areas that you know, are several hundred pages long that cover everything from the material history from a user's point of view, not from a collector's point of view, to uh, the military skills commensurate with that particular era with small arms, et cetera, et cetera. That is the base knowledge that a Marine of that era, just like a Marine today when he comes out of boot camp, he has a minimum acceptable knowledge. In, uh, material, uh, in the material and the assets he has available to him. What we try to do in, through these instructor guys, and it's much easier to do with Marines, is train by the time they get ready to go onto a live program or to do a documentary film, that those people representing the Marines of, say, 1861 are just as proficient and can project that efficiency and professionalism to the public and like that with those weapons as they are with their modern weapons. And so, so again, that's probably the biggest part of preparing and developing people is being able to put people in front of a camera that before they ever open their mouths, by the way their body language, the way they carry themselves and such, again, you've seen it, I like that, is somebody goes out there and like that, they project that confidence, they project that professionalism and stuff like that, and like that before they ever open their mouth, you don't, it doesn't matter whether they're wearing a suit and tie or they're wearing a military uniform or like that, is just who and how they carry themselves is going to project that. That's one of the things we try to do, and I like that, and is a big asset in developing documentaries you know, dealing with the Marine Corps, or in turn putting a live group of Marines in front of a live audience uh, to do programming. Now, when you do your live events, mm -hmm. um, you do them all over the place in parks, and in the state parks and, and national parks and things like that. Uh, you have a lot of logistics to deal with. I mean, not only do you have to go through the hoops of dealing with a state or federal mm -hmm. level, but also the individuals that you're going to put there, you're going to feed them, you're going oh, to, yes. uh, you've got to make sure everybody's uniforms are, are squared away. You got to, you know, you have to cover all those bases. Um, you have so many of those tasks to do. And um, specifically, again, bringing in a production company to that point, mm -hmm. to, that they're going to shoot that live event. You get one shot. Yeah. That's it. You get one shot, and not only that, there's a crowd there. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that they're not intrusive into the crowd, that the crowd can see that it's not a problem like that, and that they're also going to capture the essence of this live program that you're going to put on. 
Um, again, talk about when you'll bring a production company in for something like that um, from the start and, and the kind of things that you look for and, and are able to make sure that they do. Exactly. Well, oftentimes, like I said, we have used you all on uh, several occasions to document live programs and such. But, and it is much more difficult than if you were shooting a documentary films. As we talked about earlier, the logistics necessary in prepping and planning for a program, regardless if this is going to be live for the public or it's going to eventually be put on film, there are a lot of the same parallels. Like the, the people that are going to be in, in front of the camera or in front of the audience, as I said, uh, we have to prepare. Like I say, they're going to be on there. We have to feed them. I like that. We have to make sure we have housing when we're away from the public or in the evenings and stuff like that. So building all the logistics that a real military operation would entail or a, a shooting a major film would entail has to be accomplished here. I like that. The uniforms, unlike, uh, again, the, the upside of using the hobbyist community oftentimes, the reenactors, is they bring their own wardrobe with them. Whereas we, like that, have uniforms, and like I say, we issue the uniforms to the Marines and verify that they are wearing them properly commensurate to the period. But that means now we have to have seamstresses, and like that, tailor the uniforms to properly fit versus them looking like they're wearing a sack and such. Many of the same things, and we have learned through much of our techniques in developing live programs, goes back to the film industry. Your props masters, your wardrobe per, uh, personnel uh, and costumers and such, literally have to, we l have learned from them how to be able to manage a live program behind the scenes, prepping for and such, that they have to do on a film. And I like that is making sure that people are properly dressed, the clothing fits right, the right equipment goes with the right wardrobe, et cetera, et cetera. So that's been one of the things we have been used for the film industry and in paralleling with a production company. I like that in shooting a live film, I like that, that becomes essential that they understand and come up with that collaborative effort. Now, as you were talking about, now bringing a production company in that is going to film where we're marrying filming a live program and putting it on film as well, that makes it even much, much more difficult and how important that synergistic relationship is between the production company and the operational team and like that are because you have to understand our mission and the fact that you are basically the audience, live audience, is first priority and like that and still get everything that you need to get on film. And like that, so that again, understanding our mission, working from the ground up, even for something like this, is like that, is I wouldn't bring in a production team late in the game. And like that, literally, if it was going to be merely you coming in and filming a live program as being positioned, you still need to be in on the ground floor. And like that, and understand the pro progression of where we're going, what we're doing, and what the ultimate mission is from the get-go. And I said, you know, it's even more difficult when you have to deal around an audience and still get what you need on camera. Now, when you're setting up to uh, for the shoot itself, um, you get to the, the, the site and you're going to plan out how you're going to do it. Um, how much of their expertise do you rely on? Um, is it that you walk them through what you want? What I'm getting at is I just w would like to basically find out what your approach is and really what you're looking for out of them and what you expect out of them. Yeah, and that's it. Like say, we just talking. We get oftentimes, if possible. If we got a production team that is going to be coming and shooting a live program and such, just like shooting, if we were basically shooting without the public around, is we try to get and do a location shout, if at all possible, even if it's only the day before or early oh dark 30 that morning, and like that, is walk them through. Says, okay, here is where we're going to be doing, and like that, here's the direction and where the public's going to be. So you understand you know, that you can basically start thinking about where your camera angles are going to be and such. Here's the time of day that certain programs are going to be filmed, so you've got an idea for lighting. And like that, it may be great for an audience, but are you going to have to do anything different or basically reevaluate what cameras you use and how you use it like that as far as lighting and such? So again, like say, it's in paramount that a production team and like that, be part of the overall operational team and understand what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. And oftentimes, you know, I'll ask them, this is okay, We've got latitude of standing here versus here and presenting to the audience which way is going to work best for you. And I like that. And when we've got that latitude, we try to incorporate that to, be, again, that synergistic relationship. And I like that is, yeah, we still have to talk to that audience. We still have to get our messages across the audience to the optimum benefit of the audience. But if I can stand here versus here and accomplish the same mission and it works better that I'm standing here for you, or they're like whoever the cameraman is, then we'll make that concession and uh, and uh, move to uh, move to where the uh, cameraman needs us to be. And uh, how about 
for yourself, you talked about the logistics of everything and all these things going on, and you're usually involved in the presentation. I mean, it's a, a day on the ground is just, even though you prepare for it and prepare for it, there's little things. Um, you finally found a production company that you like to work with, mm. that you uh, can trust. How comforting is it for you, or, or not just comforting, but also just to know the fact that everything's being taken care of from the time you hit the ground, and I don't have to worry about that. That's extremely, extremely important. Like for my position as a manager and logistics planner, because 90% of my job is although you've seen me in, like, see, in the public role, I'm usually a primary narrator or presenter and such. But my principal job, that's the easy part for me. I uh, like that because I already know the dialogue and such like that. I can get there. I can relax once we're boots on the ground. Relax. It's the preparation and planning and all those unanswered questions that have to be answered, boots on the ground, preparing for the uh, unknown when we get there and such like that. Knowing that I have a team coming in that have already anticipated, are familiar with our operational procedures and such, that I don't have to look over my shoulder and micromanage to make sure they're doing, is of extreme paramount importance. The less I can basically, the more I can trust my overall team and my planners and like that, the less I have to worry about, and like it when I get boots on the ground to make sure dealing with the big picture, dealing with the hosting agency, be it the National Park Service staff, et cetera, making sure that we're meeting all their criteria and such. If I can turn around and know that the production team is going to be filling it, and like say you can either work with one, uh, one of my uh, assistant managers and like that, or one of my NCOs, or you know, having worked with us before, what we need and like that, that is of immense value. And like that, knowing that. You're going to, you know what we want to accomplish, and like I said, and the production team is going to set up to get the optimum film footage, meeting the comp mission we need. And like that, that type of um, security and is of immense value to any planner in a, in a program and such. Knowing that the ultimate documentation of what's being done is going to meet their expectations and ultimately the public's expectations that see this beyond the live audience. So really the keys from, from what I'm getting out of what we're talking about is, is the uh, experience, the, the knowledge, but mm -hmm. at, perhaps more than any of it, the collaboration and the, and the trust is, Absolutely. is paramount. As we found like that again, your production company has been extremely valuable to us and such, but all the companies we have worked with over the years, the more experience and collaborative effort that we have with those production companies, the better quality the product is ultimately going to be. Um, I like that because uh, you can remember years back, the first time that we brought your team in and liked it to work with us, it was kind of walk through and I had to exert a lot of attention to says, here's what we do. But as you gained experience of understanding how we work and I like that, it literally, I got to the point, it says, okay, Don, Mark, here's what I need. And I like that and I can shoot and forget. And I like that and that is extremely important. A modern uh, a film agency, I like that, a major director, I like that is the most effective directors have teams underneath them that can do just that. Their first ADs, their second ADs, their uh, uh, like say uh, chief of photography and all that nonsense like that directs says, this is what I want to see and their team has enough experience with that director to make what his vision is without him having to micromanage every little element of it happen. This happened with us with Clint Eastwood for example like that by, by as we got to, into heavy filming in Iceland and like that he trusted us, myself and Sergeant Major Deaver and Master Sergeant Mender as the Marines and like that says, background extras, okay, I don't care what you do. You know what they need to do to meet my vision. And basically it was a shoot and forget. He didn't care. And I like that because he knew that his team underneath it, like saying this is where that experience and uh, respect for professionalism and like that is also another element. Working with the production team is their professionalism regardless of whether they're military or not, or part of the Marine Corps or not, and like that, is the professionalism of the production team and how they conduct themselves behind the cameras getting stuff done is every bit as important of the professionalism and how those Marines in front of the cameras or in front of the public conduct themselves. And like that, and that ability, I like that, to be able, for me as a manager, to trust that the production team is going to do it is every bit as important that I trust my Marines to do what they need to do. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. No problem. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. How can everybody uh, find out a little bit more about the United States Marine Corps Historical Company? Well, I'd say it's simple. Like that right now, uh, you can go online and do a search for USMCHC.org. Um, and like that, uh, and that will take you to it. And like so we also have a Facebook site that keeps everybody up to uh, speed on current events of the programs we've got going on. Also, if they are interested, want to talk to me direct, I like that they can call our offices at 301-662-3141.
and I like that. If they have a specific project that some of the viewers may have in mind, they would like to accomplish uh, and such. Because we're always, as scheduled as available, and unfortunately we are extremely busy now, both live programming with documentary, is we're always looking to help extend the Marine Corps story. And we've developed a wide variety of partnerships with historic sites like the National Park Service. Any place throughout our history, especially within the continental United States, and like that, where uh, the Marine Corps uh, was part of a historic sites or uh, historic memorials history, and like that, we had come in and help that site tell their story from that unique Marine Corps point of view. Great. And you can always see their work at world.com, too. So Hoorah. thanks a lot, Gunny. I appreciate you joining <laughs> me. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Hoorah.